Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mary Terrace. I am the founder of Strive Publishing. I want to welcome you this evening to the Writers of African Heritage series brought to you by the Minnesota Black Publishing Arts Collaborative. Before we get started, please take a moment to make sure your device is on mute, and you may also want to turn off your video for a stronger connection. The Minnesota Black Publishing Arts Collaborative is made up of the following Black-led agencies. Strive Publishing, Papyrus Publishing, Inc., Planting People Growing Justice, In Black, Inc., and Wise, Inc. These agencies have committed to challenge and change the narrative of Black people in the stories we lift up, the books we publish, archive, and share, as well as in the work we do with our constituents to address the challenge, to address and challenge the single narratives and the huge disparities in the publishing arts field. The idea to do a series on identity came out of the Zoom event we hosted last year called Black Writers Healing. We had a wonderful panel with several local writers who in our discussion highlighted and expose the need for us to dive into the identity of Black, African, people of color, or whatever we refer, we refer to ourselves. Our conversations were infused with many of the challenges we have had over the generations regarding proximity to whiteness and or who might be seen as more or less capable based on their skin tone, place of birth, socioeconomic status, or other factors not related to heritage and lineage. In our debriefing, we decided that we must tackle this concept as we talk about and celebrate the changing narrative of Black, African people in Minnesota, in the nation, and across the world. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, Raquette CSR. Raquette is the executive director of In Black Inc., a Minnesota statewide publishing arts initiative addressing the needs of Minnesotans of African heritage. She was born in Guyana, <clears throat> immigrated to New York at an early age, and now lives in Minnesota. Raquette is a school psychologist and board member of the Friends of the University Libraries. She was a contributor to the anthology towards an African education, selected writings on the education and development of children of African heritage. I now turn it over to Raquette. Good evening, good evening, everyone. It is great to see everyone and to be here. Um, this has been in the making for, as you heard, a year. So I really appreciate your being here tonight. We are over the moon with uh, the response and with the panelists that we have that will join us this evening. Uh, without further ado, I will introduce each panelist. Now, Marlon James was born in Jamaica and spends his time living between Minnesota and New York. His most recent novel, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, the first novel in the James Dark Star Trilogy, was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award. His previous novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, was the winner of the 2015 Man Booker Prize. The American Book Award and the Annisfield Wolf Book Prize for fiction. He is also the author of the novels, John Crow's Devil, and the Book of Night Women, which won the Dayton Library Peace Prize. Professor James also teaches at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we are so thankful and grateful that he will be able to join us today. He will um, come in as we get started and then he has to leave out for, um, I'd say about 30, 40 minutes in. So we appreciate whatever time we get with um, Professor James because we know his schedule is very tight. Uh, next slide. Donata Petrus Nash is a creative activist, writer, playwright, and multidimensional performance artist who was born on Dakota land, West Indian descended, and African sourced. 
Her work centers around black wildness, futurism, ancestral healing, sweetness, spectacle, and shimmer. Her first book, the young adult novel, The Stars and the Blackness Between Them, received the 2020 Coretta Scott King Honor Book Award. She's inspired by her parents and ancestors who immigrated from Trinidad and St. Croix, one of the US and the US Virgin Island, bringing their magic and trauma with them. And it is the legacy that inspires and ripples through her art. Welcome, Janata. Next slide. Dr. Verna Cornelia Price is an internationally known human potential expert who specializes in personal power, cross-cultural communications, facilitating racism conversations, employment engagement, leadership, and managing change. Dr. Verna is the author of three books, The Power of People, Four Kinds of People Who Can Change Your Life, The Silent Cry, dealing with subtractors in work and life and the change your life in 30, I'm sorry, and change your life in 30 days. She moved to the United States from the Bahamas when she was 10 years old. Next. And Valerie Dewis is a poet, film programmer and radio host, show host. She was raised in Brooklyn by her mother who immigrated from Haiti. Dewis, it works has been featured in Minnesota's Women's Press, the Brooklyn Rail, Midway, the St. Paul Almanac, the b -Zine, a Garden of Black Joy Anthology and Under the Purple Skies, a Minneapolis Anthology. Her most recent essay is featured in What We Hunger for Refugees and Immigrant Stories from Food and Family, edited by Sun Young Shi, published by the Minnesota Historical Society Press. When she's not writing, she's the host of Project 35, a local lo-fi radio show on KRSM radio. She curates Film North's Cinema Lounge and is the shorts programmer for the Provincetown International Film Festival. Welcome, Valerie. I'd like to say welcome to all of our guests. Again, um, we couldn't ask for more in a panel, but... Um, the intro that Mary gave in regards to the question of identity um, that has plagued a lot of the discussions that we've had in the past and just our work in general, all of us have made a conscious decision to actually lift up the African black people of color, whatever it is we gravitate to in the naming of ourselves we've decided that that's something we have to lift up so that we can tell our own stories. And so we appreciate you being here and being advocates and vehicles through which our stories are told and shared and such beautiful um, renditions of who we are. And so uh, without further ado, I would like to, um, I would like to offer a um, couple of questions to start. Well, I'll just start with if each of you and whoever would like to uh, respond, but if you, you can talk a bit about your background and or how you were raised. And if you can um, let us know, how did this help shape or inform your identity in your writing? And if no one goes, I will pick. <laughs> I can start. Um, my name is Dr. Verna, uh, Verna Cornelia, and I can tell you that um, I have two names, and my last name is my married name, uh, but my two names are my two names that I was given at birth in the Bahamas. I was born and raised in, um, born in Nassau in the Bahamas. Um, I was not born in a hospital. I was born in a house. Um, uh, my mother was a, uh, a, a maid, um, and she had three children. Um, and so I ended up one of those children and it was one of those children she could not take care of because she herself was trying to make life work for her. So what the next thing that she did was she did probably the most important thing in my life um, at that time, which was to send me to my grandmother. And my grandmother, my mother is from a very small island in the Bahamas called Cat Island, C-A-T-I-S-L-A-N-D, Cat Island. 
Kent Island is said in Bahamian folklore and history to be the first place that um, Christopher and his crew coming from from the seas into the West landed um, into the West in the Caribbean in the Bahamas before coming up into uh, into the southern states. Um, so I have a heritage of slavery. Um, the slaves did not, uh, the slave owners didn't stay very long, as my history tells me, um, because the African slaves, my people, were so smart, so brilliant, they outtricked the slave owners and dug tunnels and hid from them. And one day, the slave owners literally just walked off the island and disappeared because they couldn't, they couldn't make it on their own, and my uh, forefathers wouldn't help them. And so uh, the Bahamians, we have a we have a great sense of um, of, of of owning who we are. Um, we were colonized by the British, um, but even in that, I grew up with a sea of brown, a sea of uh, uh, vanilla brown, uh, honey brown, oak brown, deep 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 dark chocolate brown, on this very small island with my with my grandmother. Um, and so that lesson, I was taught a lesson from my grandmother, which actually has influenced my work greatly. And that lesson, um, my grandmother had 10 children, my mother being one of them. I have 76 first cousins. And so I grew up with a lot of cousins. And um, I grew up with love. And I grew up with an honoring of humanity. And my grandmother taught me that uh, people are people and that I should love people and serve people and honor people. And um, what I didn't know is that she was teaching me something very important about how powerful people are. Um, and I kept that. So at the age of 10, when my mother got married and moved us here to the States to supposedly have the American dream, um, I, I was, I was, boy, I was, uh, I was traumatized. Let me just put it that way. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Janata or Valerie? Go, Valerie. Valerie. You want to go, Valerie? Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Okay. Um, I was, um, my parents are from Haiti. Um, my, um, I know in my bio, there's only my mother in there, but my father is also still in my life and he's, he's here, um, and still living. Um, we, I was born in Brooklyn. I grew up in, uh, an extended sort of family. Um, my uncle lived with us. So actually both uncles on, um, my mother's side and on my father's side. And, um, my parents always taught me to, to love observation and to love um, just to, to watch and to be really aware of what's going on around you, what's going on in the world. Um, my parents were also very big on, uh, especially as a young child, I'm trying to figure out things, they, uh, which is where my love of movies come from. Uh, they're like, all right, we can't teach you anything about this culture. So you need to like watch it on television. You need to figure that out yourself. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time just sort of watching movies, trying to sort of like decipher like, okay, what does it mean to, what does America mean in a way? Um, so I learned it through there in, in a way. Um, Cause of course I also had like personal experiences, but um, at the same time I'm learning about my parents and I'm learning about what it means to when I, walk through the threshold of like, okay, I'm outside of the house, what that life is. And once you're inside of the house, what that life is. And it's a very separate, different life. Um, but it was also, also um, I don't know, I, for, for me, it was really, um, there was lots of protection. There was lots of love. There was lots of caring. There was lots of stories. Um, everybody's telling stories from my uncles to my mom and my dad and and a lot of times it was the same stories, but as I got older, they became funnier because I, I understood the context more. So <laughs> it was just um, lots of sharing and lots of um, um, rich storytelling. Um, so I, I, for me, um, it was always a context of something that I felt um, uh, very 
safe within. Um, I also had, um, where I grew up in Brooklyn, there were lots of, um, there were lots of black people, there were lots of Caribbean people. Um, there were of course, you know, it's New York City, so there's of course white people, but I felt like my life felt very, my upbringing felt very black. Like it, I, I felt very um, well situated in that milieu. I might've always been the oddball, but I was always surrounded by brownness. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was, um, it's interesting now being a person, a Caribbean person living in the Midwest. You're like, oh, <laughs> it's very different. Um, <laughs> so it's, um, this has been, uh, you know, uh, a real learning curve for me. I am totally agreeing with everything you're saying. Born in Guyana and came here at nine, lived in Brooklyn. We call it a little Africa, a little Caribbean because everybody from every island lived there. And so it is so warming to hear the storytelling was a big part of your life, um, as was, I think, a lot of ours. Janata, what does yours look like? Um, first of all, thank y'all and, you know, for having me here and just to be in the midst of all these tremendous Black publishers. I just, like, am in such deep awe and gratitude to y'all, so wanted to say that first. Um, but yeah, like I um, come from um, a Trinidadian mother and a Crucian father from St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. And I'm the first Minnesotan of my family. Um, and I think that um, it is very interesting being um, West Indian Caribbean in the Midwest because it's so few of us, you know, it's not like when you go to Toronto or London or, um, Brooklyn, um, where it's kind of like these sort of um, small, you know, kind of um, contingencies and embassies of, you know, Caribbean culture all over the place. Um, so I feel like, you know, here I was an awkward kind of weird kid in the context of like culturally, I didn't have um, a lot of people who understood me and I didn't realize that's how I was kind of being perceived as maybe an other or a different kind of kid. So I think like I always live with this sort of, um, I don't know, like sense of like outsiderness, you know, that I really, and maybe that's also due to queerness or due to like, you know, some of the different like kind of artsy and you know my astrological sign who knows why I was the weird kid but um I do feel like I felt very um uh yeah like I think like I definitely had to find myself in you know art you know as far as like you know what is this culture that kind of only lives in my home you know what I mean like I felt like my home, like I think a lot of you said, felt extremely Caribbean, you know what I mean? Like my Trinidadian mom, her sisters, the way they laugh, the kind of food we ate, the jokes, the storytelling. Like I felt like I knew these places because I knew so many stories. I knew so many people, so many relatives, you know? And I think there's a certain way that Caribbean people tell stories, you know, that feels very African and feels very like diasporic, you know? Like I feel, what I love about being Caribbean is that I don't feel separate from being Black American. You know, I don't feel separate from Africa or, you know, Black folks from all over. Like, I certainly feel a certain kind of, like, energy that, you know, exists and exudes from people from certain places. But I really do love feeling kind of like this connection of all of us, no matter what. Um, but yeah, so more like, you know, I think I also come from a very big family. Like, you know, I'm one of 11 kids of my father. You know, he had baby mamas from Honduras to Trinidad, from Wisconsin. He did get him a Wisconsin baby mama, which is also a very Minneapolis thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like, I also grew up in a place where it's like, okay, not only is it, you know, kind of like a black community that, um, it, it was a black community that didn't feel like, you know, very connected and coherent and cohesive in the ways that I felt when I, you know, lived in New York and lived in Brooklyn for years and was like in places where, you know, there was just such a black dignity, you know what I mean? And a black sort of, you know, um, 
coziness. Even me as an outsider from Minnesota, I felt like I was a part of this milieu, you know, this total, you know, kind of cosmic constellation of blackness that can kind of accumulate in some of these bigger, denser cities. And I felt like in Minneapolis, um, I didn't feel like beautiful. I didn't feel like seen as interesting or cool. You know, I, I, I definitely feel like there, and I don't know, maybe this was my experience and I don't know what other black folks feel, but I do feel like there, I didn't feel as seen and as beautiful until I went to places where there are more black Caribbean people and black folks of the diaspora. Cause, and I feel like that's, things are changing here but I do feel like um, to kind of speak to some of this colorism conversation and whatnot, like I do feel like in Minneapolis, um, there was in the 80s, a sort of um, thirstiness to like, you know, be with white women, you know, and that was a part of my family story, you know, um, and it's a thing that like, I don't know, I'm, that's just my reality. People might feel different. Okay, thank you, Jolene. Um, and also like um, a fairness and proximity to whiteness, you know, that like I wasn't either. And my mom, for those of you who know my mom, she's from Trinidad and she's an African black Trini, you know, like her hair has been shaved, dark skin, bangles, like she's always loved how African and black she's looked, you know? So my upbringing was like, I don't know why. Yeah, my upbringing was kind of trying to make sense of myself being in this like kind of, huger context of like Minneapolis's sort of like complicated and um, <clears throat> tortured relationship with blackness and ability to have a lot of intimacy with it, but not actually be accountable to like black sovereignty and power. And then also my beautiful black Caribbean household that was just so like fascinatingly beautiful, you know? So yeah, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that sprinkle, you know? Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. I can see the colors. I can smell the curry. I can I can feel the energy in terms of the household because I know that experience. And I um I really I wrote um quite a bit, you know, as a child and then growing up, but um never kind of like for the public. Uh, I think kind of what a lot of you mentioned. I always felt like I was a second language. Um, English is a second language, even though I came from an English speaking, formerly British colonized um, nation. Um, so just thinking through how do you, um, as a first generation Caribbean um, woman, actually think about what your parents or what your family or what that experience have given you um, how is that reflected in how you write or what you write? How do you feel that kind of coming through, flowing through you? Well, I can, I can start. Um, here's, here's what didn't happen, okay, in my family. Uh, because being raised on, you know, when, when you look at brain research of, of small children, about everything that you put into your life that really gets cemented into your life is cemented by the time you're 10 years old. So I, I thank God that I was in the Bahamas until I was 10 years old because I, had, I got some things cemented in my brain that I needed to use once I got to this country. And one of the things that was cemented in my brain was that I was amazing. <laughs> like, like I, I was it. Like, like I was incredible. Like I was the smartest ever, the prettiest ever. I was bold, brilliant, black, beautiful, and blessed. All of the beasts. And none of those bees desecrate who I am. Hello, America, right? And so I was all of that and never ever in my psyche, there's nowhere in my, in my, in my unconscious self was there ever a question that for some reason, because of the color of my skin, I was less than. So I had no, I, I had no like 
Like just because you're white, you're better. That's, that's not even in me. It's, it just wasn't even in my psyche. And so as a result, even at the age of 10 years old, when I came to the United States, saw homeless people on the street, which I had never seen homeless people before in my country, on my island, there was never anyone homeless, you know, auntie so-and-so, cousin so-and-so, you know, mama so-and-so, you know, uncle, everyone got taken in, everyone got given something to eat, everyone got a place to sleep, everyone was loved. So, you know, when I came to this country at 10 years old and saw destitute people, I've never seen that before. You know, I saw a sadness I haven't seen before. Um, and the other thing too is I, for the first time, I realized that there were categories of people apparently in America that didn't talk to each other. Because when I went to school, there was the white group there was the black group and then there was this other group I didn't know anything about that had dark hair and kind of dark eyes and you know uh you know big brown eyes and you know dark eyebrows and bronzy people and they spoke a different language and I came to know that they were from the Latin world Cuban Puerto Rico Mexican Latina so forth and so on so there's three different groups and none of those groups talked to each other so what I had to figure out in all of this was who was I going to be? But I, I, I already had cemented in my mind an understanding that I already had what I, what I needed. So then I spent my time observing, observing how this America worked. And then I learned something. I learned how to communicate across all of these cultures and stand my ground in who I was. So I think that comes out in my writing, you know, whether you're reading The Power of People, about the four kinds of people who can change your life, adders, subtractors, multiplies, and dividers, whether you're reading about how to deal with these subtractors or reading how to change your life, you know, that message that comes through is, is one clear focused message, which is that you have everything you need, that you're powerful enough, you're amazing enough to create the change that you wanna see in your life, in your family, in your world, that, that you already have it going on. There's no need, there's no competition. I have no competition. I have no, I, I, I don't, you know, there's no intimidation. There's no like comparison, you know, like Miss Valerie, guess what? She's got it going on. Cause why? She's Miss Valerie. She's got her thing and that's her. Yes. So I, I think that that's, that is what my blessing was coming from, from, from the Bahamas and, you know, and good, bad, ugly, or indifferent. I've had to stand in that. And, and, and I think it comes out in my writing. Janata, I'm gonna repeat that part. Um, how do you bring your Caribbean-ness, your, uh, you know, the rearing that you got from your family into how you write and what you write. Yeah, I feel like, I don't know, I just am so grateful to like the way that I was raised and getting to just hear all these stories. Like I think being Caribbean people in the depth of a tundra, like you have to remind yourself you're a Caribbean person, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think like that was something that happened often in our homes through storytelling, through the food, through, yeah, just like kind of creating all these landscapes for me, you know? Um, and I think about also like, I feel like as I've gotten older, but I feel like as a child, I always was just so curious and connected to the ancestors and talking and listening for them, you know? And I feel like there's ways that as a person who writes and when you sit down and you're in that zone and you're just like it's interesting because like as a kid I started out as like a poet like doing all this like emo kind of sad like poetry it was good it probably was good but it certainly was very emotional and um also to like loving to think of stories and stuff like that um and like loving um writers like you know um Alice Walker and Zora Neale Hurston and Entozake Shange and all of these people who really allowed how Black people sound 
to be in the text, you know, like, I just loved that, you know, like, I loved, you know, yeah, Maya Angelou, Nikki Giovanni, like, people who just created these, like, beautiful sort of, yeah, like, I really feel grateful for that. So anyway, just like, I feel like as a writer, I really am interested in like, how do I make clear that the people in here are black and they come from somewhere? They're not generic. You know what I mean? That like, for me, like I very much, you know, um, the um, young adult book I wrote, um, it takes place in Minneapolis and Trinidad um, and in part of Spain where my mom is from. And it really was like this powerful opportunity to get to go to Trinidad, you know, I'd been to Trinidad as like, you know, oh, you know, this is where my family's from, but to go to Trinidad in my nerdy literary lens and like get to like interview people and talk to them um, and think about like how in writing stories from Trinidad, do I acknowledge that like, yeah, I wasn't born there, you know, um, and I haven't lived there. Um, and there's people who have experiences there that I want to connect with and I get to connect with them through the beauty of art and creativity mm -hmm. and um, writing and stuff like that. So yeah, I feel like also growing up, like my mom is like a chef and like, you know, for her, like she just, my mom, like the way she talks about food, it's so funny. And she said this recently, she's like, you know, I read cookbooks, like people read novels, you know, you know, like that's how she feels about food. It's like, oh, you know, like it's her stories, you know, she sees stories and food, you know, and that's the thing I definitely bring in the page. Um, and my dad was a vocalist and song writer, you know, he had bands growing up and before I was born and, you know, like he just always was just so quirky. Like he could come up with a story and like a persona on the drop of a hat, you know, and it's a thing that I really do, you know, embody in, in the work, you know, um, and really thinking like, what are these like cultural elements of, you know, Trinidad, for example, you know, of, you know, carnival and like, you know, all of these different nuances, you know, that um, aren't kind of these, the glittery sort of context, but how do I get into all of these elements or what happened to black maternity in Trinidad? You know, how is that in the work that I write for young adult kids, you know? So yeah, Valerie, I'm handing it to you, Fran. In my opinion, um, I mean, I write a lot of poems um, when I tend to write poetry and essays. And for me, I feel like um, Haiti shows up in, in the way that I talk about, I think partly the way I talk about food, the way that the foods that I bring up um, in its, but it's sort of like, it's not, you learn about a place so much about from the stories that you hear, right? So you're living in this home, I'm living with my parents, with my family members, and they're talking about Haiti and it feels like a place that I know, but it's also a place that I don't really know well. And when I do go there, I'm a tourist, right? It's, it's like, I, and they can tell right away, they're like, you're not from here. And I'm like, ah. And it's, so it's like this, this relationship that you're still trying to like, I mean, till this day, I'm still trying to sort of unravel it and figure it out and really get into it. But it's also, I mean, it's difficult because of the political situa situation in Haiti. And so, and so some of the politics sometimes comes into my work. The way that I um, try to discuss um, straddling these sort of different cultures, you know, you're being in the US, being Haitian, how does that connect for me? What parts of it do I are really part of me and I keep and then what parts of it that I'm sort of like, I don't know if I want to necessarily deal with this sort of whatever. Um, people always ask me like, well, why did you move to the, like the Midwest? Um, Cause family is hard sometimes. <laughs> I love my family. <laughs> They're wonderful, but it's also like, so it's, I feel like um, sometimes you need that sort of space to be able to appreciate and to see better. And also you need to like, because sometimes like the expectations, especially, you know, coming out to your family as an artist um, and you're not a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or whatever other, the trinity of jobs that they want you to have. Um, it becomes sort of like this like heaviness of like, I don't know if we came all the way here for you to do this. And you're like, well, didn't you come all the way here for me to do whatever I want? Like, isn't that the whole point? But it's always a struggle, right? So, so it's like, um, but all of those sort of struggles are in my work. Like, I, I feel like my work talks a lot about like, you know, homeland and like, and 
themes of belonging and regret and things that aren't realized and sort of like that that wanting something that isn't there anymore but not knowing how to move on or also not how to let go is how do you because a lot again all the stories you hear I mean, I'm, I'm, we're talking about sunday dinner is like we're going to talk about this battle in the haitian revolution you're like okay and so you're sitting there eating dinner and you're listening to this whole fight about whatever it's and you know in the haitian revolution this general says this and this person says that and how it all works out and, and it's and it's fascinating and it's wonderful and it really feeds your like self-esteem so you have that sort of feeling of like um this is who i am other people can't tell me who i am and so it's 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 something that I, I think I see like a struggle in like a lot of my friends who are different cultures, like, where do I stand? Who am I? What am I doing? And it's not something that I necessarily felt like I ever struggled with because I was just like, well, this is sort of clear, like, this is who I am. Like, you know, we burn down houses, we're cutting off heads. Like, this is what <laughs> this is what it is about. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's sort of interesting to sort of um, I'm still sort of working it out through through my work and sort of trying to see the different places that it fits and whatever else. But um, th this final thing is like my mom passed about five years ago, and I have to say that since her passing, I have. It's interesting. I feel more Haitian now than I ever did. Like it's like things that I thought that I lost are more connected in a way. Like I just. I, I don't know what it is. It's like dreams are more vivid. Things are clearer. I don't, it, we, we're having conversations and dreams. It's a whole thing. Like, it's like, it's really kind of an intense, different relationship with my mom who's past. It's, it's, so it's, it's something I'm still working through, <laughs> but, but uh, I think it shows up in my work in all these different sort of ways. And, and also just being a teenager in New York, it's like that also, I think the city also um, gives my work a lot of structure because I talk a lot about um, being in New York and being Caribbean in New York and and that sort of like again not in your homeland but it's also your homeland but you still don't feel at home but what does home mean yeah so <sighs> this is this is absolute fire you guys um your experiences your just the colors that I see as you speak um I had a dance teacher, and I think Janata might have danced with her years ago, Mother Busara uh, Whitaker, who um, used to say, your body has memory. So while you were talking, Valerie, I kept thinking about that whole um, thing of you might not have been born there, but your body has memory through your mom's body and her mom and just all the stories that are passed through. And in thinking about that, um, moves me to my next question in terms of, let's pretend or assume that there's a global or even a localized black or African identity. And I want you guys to share like, how would you describe your identity? And I know you've been doing parts of that, but with a little more um, directness, how do you describe your identity? Um, not just, I, in somewhere in my spirit, refuse to have people just have me be just the Guyanese because I also claim all people of African descent regardless of where you know they are so a lot of a lot of even my own family sometimes has um a hard times with you know this is American this is Guyanese you know there, there's like a distinction but I think when you get to a place where you understand the layers that we have piled on us you kind of is able to capture all of those different layers in some way. So I just want you to talk a little about that. And I'll repeat the question because I know I, I spoke a little longer afterwards, but how would you describe your identity? Um, pretending that there is a localized or a global Black African identity. And let's start with, um, I know you just finished talking, Valerie, but you want to go ahead and start? I'm kind of mixing it up a little. Sure. Um, I, I think of my identity as some sort of like, it's like hybridity. It's, it's, it's an amalgamation of different, it's, it's, for me, it's hard to describe because I, you know, I think of it as sort of like, it's like, you know, you live in New York City, there's so many different people, you have so much contact with so many types of people. It's like, you know, there's, and I think of like, the things that 
you know, my mom used to work in like, you know, in uh, a psychologist's home. And so she would come home with like different ideas. She's like, oh, I saw this woman do this at her home. We're going to try this. Oh, I saw this. And so it's like, so then small things would sort of come in and then you're sort of like, and then they become part of you. And then you talk to the person later, you're like, oh, this is not even yours. This is somebody else's. But it's like, I think these little sort of bits of like different types of like, especially cultures that feel that feel, I guess, similar or, or connected in a way. Um, so it's, it's like, I think of it as sort of like, it's, I mean, it's sort of like Pan-African in a way, because it's like, you have all of these different groups of people who are all getting along and get together and, and connected in these sort of ways that, that make living um, at least, it, at least in, a, in a city and whatever else it makes it, it makes it happens. It works. Um, I know that's here. Um, um, it's funny again. Like living here makes me realize the things that look, when I'm in New York, I don't notice how Haitian I am or the or my Caribbean as much. But here, I definitely see it. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It's like I think of that as like that's just me, and I'm just like, oh, that's well, that's not American, in, in, like in that way though. <laughs> that this is this is you, but this is different. And I was like, oh, that's that's what that is. Um, so it's like it's it's a sort of like hyphenated identities that you sort of like try to fit in some sort of way. I'm not really sure if I'm answering the question necessarily, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, for me it feels like this again, hybrid, pan, African kind of mix of different things. Because we see so many things that we do that are similar, right? So you talk to other people, it's like everybody makes their rice this different way and you make your rice this way and this person, it's, we have so many things that we've, I feel like, especially Caribbean folks have held on to that we didn't necessarily lose or feel disconnected from. So it's, I don't know, for me, it's, it's, it's interesting when I do talk to folks who are from the continent and I'm just like, oh, look at this. This is the same. All right, that's good. Good job. We held on to that. Um, and then, I mean, again, and it was just a matter of like, I mean, for those of you who know Haitian history, we just were like, nah, we're not. That's cute. We're not doing this. <laughs> we're going to do what we want. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, lots of lip service, but we just, we're going to do what we want. And we just held on to the things that we wanted to hold on to. Um, yeah, so yeah, anyway, that's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Janata, let's hear it from you. Um, could you repeat the question one more time? Because I really was caught all up in Valerie's <laughs> response, actually. Okay. I was saying that let's pretend that or assume that there's a global or even a localized Black African identity and wanted to know how would you describe your identity? Kind of like, how does that actually um, take light? Yeah, I think um, it's been interesting like over the years because like I feel I certainly had a sort of awakening of consciousness around Blackness and Africanness like when I was a teenager. Um, which is around the time I met Sister Raquette and Brother Nura. And, you know, I'd known, you know, Sister Sehet since I was a, a child, you know, because her and my older sister were close friends. And I remember when Sehet changed her name and like wore a head wrap. And I just was like, wow, she's cool. She's different like me. You know what I mean? Like in my little small self, you know? Um, and I think like that was a time that also allowed me to be like, oh, like I'm connected to like I'm black and no matter what kind of black you are, we're all black together, <laughs> you know, because in school, I do think like, you know, a lot of, I think black folks are conditioned to, you know, sort of otherize or separate in certain ways that aren't necessarily real to the black experience. I see it still, you know, I do feel like um, for me, like, at a young age, I really got proud, um, certainly as an adolescent of being, you know, Black, African and Caribbean, you know, like seeing all of these sort of, I think as a young person, I was very proud of like Blackness, but I was learning about like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. So I was like, yeah, man, I'd be like Malcolm X. Like I identified with like revolutionaries, you know what I mean? So I feel like my Black identity definitely is based in radical 
blackness and like resistance and totally sort of the older I've gotten, I've been very interested in looking at the ways that like black identity intersects with um, the divine feminine, you know, with like um, also ancestral experiences um, of queerness that like, I think as a young person, I felt like, oh, either I'm black and Caribbean and African in this way and or I'm queer. Like I can't necessarily see these things as existing at the same time. And I was really grateful, you know, like when I was like, oh, James Baldwin is like, you know, a black queer man, Audre Lorde. You know, I remember reading the book by Rosa Guy, um, I think it was called Ruby, you know, where there's a queer storyline. So I think for me, I've really like, as I've gotten older, been very interested in being like, oh yeah, like who are sort of like the black artists and dancers and experimental folks. Um, as well as, um, yeah, like people who really did like live in a sense of, you know, um, collective and expansive blackness. Cause I do think there's not been a place where I've traveled to, like I studied abroad in Brazil, I studied in Cuba. I, you know, have traveled countless places. My wife is from Cameroon. Um, and, you know, there's just this way that like, you know, um, like you were saying, Valerie, like, dang, there's some stuff you can't, you can't take out of a black person, I don't care. You know, and it's no matter how many generations, no matter how many languages you done took out our mouth, you're going to see somebody in Atlanta joking just like they from Benin, period. You know what I'm saying? And like that to me is something I just feel so much pride in, you know? So um, I think for me, um, yeah, like I think my Black identity is just like so curious and expansive and like constantly like unfurling and deeply ancestral and deeply cosmic and futuristic. Um, and, you know, inclusive of a lot of different kinds of vibes. So, yeah. And like, I think similar to what you said, Valerie, like, or maybe that was um, what you said, um, Dr. Verna, but I'd be like, everywhere I'm around some black people, I'm like, yeah, we up in here together. This is us. Like, yeah. Like when I was in Brazil, I was seeing my aunt, like I would see women. I'd be like, wow, y'all straight up look like my aunties. And I was taught to think that I would go to Brazil and I would not see people who look like me. You know what I mean? Like when I went to Cameroon, I'm seeing black people who just, and it's just so beautiful us, no matter where we are. I go to Atlanta and I, or New Orleans and just see how black folks, this music from the South, the music from West Africa, it's just like, so in the future, you know, this, we just live in that place. So anywho, <laughs> what do you think Dr. Verna? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I was thinking a couple of things. Um, one is my first day of school in America. Okay. So my name is Dr. Verna Cornelia, right? Verna Cornelia. And the only reason that I say doctor is because after I got my PhD from the University of Minnesota, I used to always call myself Miss Verna. And because um, and I'm a former teacher. And so my PR agent said, you will not ever call yourself Miss Verna again. You've earned a PhD and you will call yourself Dr. Verna. That's who you are. So I kind of got straight about that, right? And my first day in school, the teacher said, um, it's Verna here. Well, in the Bahamas, I had never been called Verna. I, I didn't even know my name was Verna. The Bahamians always called me my middle name, which was Cornelia. And they didn't even call me my whole middle name, Cornelia. They said, Cornel. So all of my aunties, all of my cousins, and I lived with 15 of my cousins, sleeping five in a bed. And they called me Cornel, Cornel, Cornel. So here's this American teacher in front of an American classroom in Delray Beach, Florida, and she said, Verna, first day of school, is, this, is there a Verna here? So I sat there, little girl from the Bahamas, right? Sat there. I didn't know what she was talking about. And then she said, Verna Cornelia? And then I thought, well, Cornelia kind of sounds like my name. I guess that must be me. So I said, oh, well, my name is Verna, my name is Keneal. She said, then you must be Verna Cornelia. Now, at that moment, two lands had connected for me. I realized that I was in two different places. I had a homeland of the Bahamas where I was 
Canil. Now here I was in the United States where this white teacher was calling me Verna. And the truth is the Bahamians can't even say V. We say W. We don't, we, we don't pronounce Vs very well. We say Woyna. So she wasn't even saying the Woyna correctly. And so identity, a new name was formed for me. I was now Verna. And as I, as I grew and understood myself more in this land, I made a decision that I will always use my first two names. I will use Verna and Cornelia all times because for me, it represents a coming together of two nations, right? So I always stand in a place of knowing that I am fully Bahamian. I am an African Caribbean woman, truly African slaves. I am a descendant of some of the first African slaves landing in the Bahamas, African Caribbean and slaves who were so smart, they outsmarted, you know, the folk and they had to go and we built a land. Those are my people, African Caribbean. Now in the United States, my second land, I found out something very fascinating. I found out that to white people, um, Caribbean black people were considered exotic. So I would have my African-American friend, homegrown from Atlanta, homegrown from Miami, Delray Beach, Cleveland, wherever we are in the United States, homegrown Mississippi, African-American friend, and then myself, right? Two lands. And we go someplace and someone would say, oh, where are you from? Because my little, because you know, I, I had a, an accent. And um, I'd say, well, I'm from, you know, I'm from the Bahamas. And Miss Raquette, the whole conversation would change. It was as if my African-American brothers and sisters became invisible, as if they had no name, as if they did not exist. And the first time this happened to me, I made a decision that when I'm with white people, when I'm with white people, okay, in white Minnesota, I am always African-American and I am always black. No, no discussion, no discussion of difference whatsoever. I stand in total allegiance, total rank file with my brothers and sisters. I don't care where you are from in the world. If you are brown folk of African descent, I'm with you, I stand with you. And so people will say to me, well, where are you from? Well, I came here from Cleveland is what I tell them. I came here from Cleveland. Until I really get to know them, then I have a real conversation. But until then, mm-mm, mm-mm, nope, stand. So I'm an African American, I stand in my African Caribbean, African American, right? And then when I went to Kenya, Africa, boy, I stood on Kenyatta Boulevard and watched my brothers and sisters, oh. Oh, you thought I was bad before? But when I, by the time I came back from Kenya, oh, I was untouchable. I was like, oh no, oh no, 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 it's on now, it's on. Okay, well, no, 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 it is on. Yeah, 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 shoot. I mean, cause it's so beautiful. <laughs> Mana, you've been to, you must, you must have been to Kenya before. It is so beautiful. You know, like every, every, every shade of brown, just African, just, just amazingly brilliant people. And then it occurred to me, Miss Raquette, no wonder the white people went to get the Africans, you know, to become slaves because we were the smartest, daggone it. We were the smartest, we were the blessed, we were the brilliant, we were the strongest ones. No wonder, right? Yeah. Because we had it going on. That's what I'm talking about. They had, they needed somebody to build something. Who could build something? We were the people who could build it. You know, when our young people understand that, mm. like you, do you even know who you are? Mm. Do you even know who you are? Anyway, 
I could go on. Let me tell you, Ms. Valerie, I could go on for a while. So I'm going to stop now. We would love for you to go on for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, we do have some constraints, but I, I mean, I absolutely adore you guys. And I think what you said is absolutely true. Um, my experience, I mean, um, I came here when I was eight and for a year I didn't speak because I got that um, roasting that, you know, most of the Caribbean students got coming into a classroom where people are like, what'd you say? Where are you from? And then after that, it was just like, you know, open season. And so I didn't speak for almost a year. Um, the term selective mute didn't exist at the time, but that's pretty much what I was termed because I, I had one friend. She was also from an island. Um, I think she was from Trinidad. We mm -hmm. spoke to each other, but I didn't speak to anybody else. I mean, and so the teachers were concerned until they got my grades and stuff. Then it was like, oh, okay. You know, she knows what's going on. But I literally did not speak. And the piece around the um, our names, I think the names thing um, is something that was huge. Um, all of our names and our families are shortened on the island. And then we, when we come here, my first name was Marilyn. Um, the middle name was Susan. And I had a community name change. So it's Marilyn Susan Frazier. Um, I remember when we came into the country, um, my mom called, everybody calls me Marlon. So they're like, Marlon, Marlon. They don't pronounce the Marilyn. And the customs folks were so upset that they were like, okay, we're gonna call you by your middle name because they couldn't get the, you know, the accent of my family and the use of it using Marilyn as Marlon that they were like, you know what, let's start that out all together. And they went straight to Susan. We know Susan, let's use Susan. And so all the way through high school, um, my school name was Susan. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, like in my family and at home, sometimes we'd be like, who's that? <laughs> and it, it, it's just the, the double um, existence that I think we have is something that um, not just Caribbean folks, but people from the continent, which we'll talk about, you know, our next part of our series will be uh, writers from the continent. They have that experience. But um, I really feel like the forming of an identity for all of us that then takes um, life in our writing um, has happened. Like, it sounds like it's happened in a similar way. And I'm, I'm trying to um, also look at what are maybe some challenges that you feel like you've encountered with even the coming into knowing who you are as a writer, because, um, and I'll give you a brief story. I know growing up, my dad is the person I go to who I think put a lot of images and sounds like every Saturday was Calypso. It was, you know, um, George Clinton, it was, um, it was all of these, this music, um, James Brown, he, it didn't matter if it was West Indian, if it was continental, if it was, it was just all this music that was played. And then the blackness was, you know, he carved, he, he drew. So he would carve all these rich looking black, you know, big African women and, you know, lots of animals he always carved. And so all those things around the house, I think, when I became conscious, I went back to that. And so looking at how our consciousness is built and how that is not just unilinear, it's not a linear consciousness, it's kind of spread out. I feel like our responsibility as writers um, is embedded in that process that we have had. Like the way we write kind of reveals our own coming into consciousness. So if you can just talk a little about that, and then I wanna make sure we leave enough time to kind of open up to folks. Oh, and one apology, I, I'm not sure if um, Marlon was able to get on. I don't know where our, we kind of missed each other, but I do apologize that uh, you haven't been able to hear him tonight, but you three women have been fire. And I appreciate your, your being here and your um, stories. So let's keep this going, but the challenges, 
what are some of the challenges that you feel like you've come against in terms of forming that writer that you have become or yeah you can take that from there well i'll go ahead and start because mine i think mine is pretty simple i never intended to be a writer okay it was never in my you know is somewhere like in my in my goals to be a writer um um so I only began to write because it's what God told me to do. And so when I was inspired to write my first book, it's what I did. Um, what I didn't know was that I was entering a field that is dominated by white men. And so my books are self-help, empowerment um, sorts of books, okay? That field is dominated by white men. And so, and with a first name of Verna, Often, um, people would think that I was actually a white Jewish woman, a, a white German woman um, with the name Verna. And so before Google came into it, you know, there were many times where I would show up um, before they could Google me and my assistant would happen to be white and they would, they would uh, meet us at the door and welcome my assistant and say to my white assistant, hello, Dr. Verna. And then, um, and then my assistant, of course, like white people do often, will turn red and say, I apologize, Dr. Verna. You know, I'm so, this is not, this is Dr. Verna here. And so for me, the challenge has been kind of blasting into this field that's been dominated by white men and finding my place in that field and, and, and continue to hold my place until to grow my place. The other thing too is that, um, is my other challenge is that African American people, a lot of African American people are not buying self help books. And so my audience, most of the people who buy my books are white women. And um, so what I really and, and the stuff in the books actually get you to your next level. So my challenge really is that in my writing, because my 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 writing looks more like kind of dominant white man self empowerment sort of writing. Um, to really get our own community to get hold of that stuff and to use it to get to their next level. So um, that's that's a short of mine. And I'm still working through that. I'm still working through that. And I'm still working on pouncing on the white men and getting to the place where my keynote speech is a $60,000 an hour keynote, just like some of these other people, right? And stop settling for this little piece of pitiful change that these people around here want to give me to keynote at my level, uh, because the field is wide open for it, and I'm and I'm going for it. Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay, Valerie. Challenges. Um, for me, I mean. Uh, I think some of the challenges are getting people to sort of understand, and I don't really know if it's if understand is the right word, but to sort of see the connections I'm trying to make. And so, you know, I'll write a piece and I write different pieces. And I, again, I, for me, it feels a lot like collage. So I sort of like, I'm connecting these different parts of myself and, and um, you know, saying what I have to say. Mm -hmm. And I, I get a lot of questions about like, well, what, what exactly is this? And then I spend my time explaining like, well, Caribbean culture, blah, blah, blah. And so it, it's so I, I feel like I spend a lot of time explaining and not people not understanding necessarily. Um, I'm working on that clearly. Um, but it's, I think those are the those are the challenges that I think that I come across. Um, because I think that people, you know, when people meet me, they, you know, the assumptions like, hey, she's a black girl, black girl, whatever. Um, without any sort of like understanding of like the, the there are differences, you know, the, the variety, the, the complexities that are there. Um, and then so I'll talk about all kinds of different topics and then it sort of comes up with, I thought you were, and I'm like, yes, I'm that girl who was born in Brooklyn, I had heavy Haitian parents. And so there's a whole layer of other stuff that's also involved there. Um, and then I spend my time explaining what that layer is. But those are the challenges I think I come across. And I come across those challenges with like, I mean, white folks, black folks, all kinds of folks really. 
Um, I rarely come across those challenges though in um, New York because again, there's so many people there <laughs> that understand in, in that sort of like already have the lingo whether or not they are, you know, necessarily Caribbean or not, but they, they, they have a Caribbean girlfriend. They know somebody who's somebody, you know, so they, so they sort of are like, all right, I get this, you're, you're this. Um, whereas again, in this Minnesota context, I'm, I'm like, so, okay, let me, let me give y'all a history lesson. It's, and then I, and sometimes I don't feel like doing that. <laughs> I'm like, somebody read a book. I don't want to do it. I don't want to give the history lesson. I just want to write my work and move on. But those are the challenges I think sometimes uh, that I come across. I need to have a better attitude about it though. <laughs> I'm working on it. Yeah. And Janata? Yeah, and the question exactly again is? Um, what are some of the challenges, let's see, that or, well, challenges or complexities that you might come up against in terms of being able to um, exude or uh, relate this knowledge that you have of who you are in terms of your identity in your writing or through yeah. your writing? Yeah, no, I feel like that's been kind of the fun part of writing fiction. Um, and writing like playwriting is that like, I really get to create these worlds where people like me exist. Black girls in the Midwest who are first generation Caribbean and black American and African and quirky. And I think that's kind of what I love. Like I mentioned um, Rosa Guy before and some people, um, you know, celebrated her as well because um, yeah, like I think as Black artists, you have to create what you don't see. And I think particularly in places of fiction or, um, you know, like I've done playwriting, I've done some screenwriting, um, and also like, I, um, you know, my young adult book, um, I really was, you know, sort of inspired to be like, yeah, like I wanted to see, you know, like I used to read all these like romance books, like cheesy, you know, kind of like whatever they had at the library, I was consuming it. Um, and anytime there was like, you know, a little romance, like I love that stuff. You know, I love the like sensuality, the making out, all of that stuff. But there were never like black girls like me who existed in those spaces, you know? Um, and I also felt like, you know, there just wasn't compared to now, there's so many tremendous black young adult writers and children's book writers who are like getting more and more published, you know, and um, I think like it's critical, you know, for young people to feel like they exist and to feel beautiful and empowered, especially, you know, when you don't get to grow up in places like Brooklyn or, you know, the Caribbean where you see your image kind of affirmed to you in all these various ways, like books are really where, you know, you can find a sense of self, you know, so I think for me as a writer, um, you know, I think like, yeah, like I think as far as challenges, like I do think I had to build up to a certain kind of confidence that, you know, like, yo, like, let me write these stories. Like, cause I think like I started off as a young adult, well, as a youth worker, you know? Um, and then I got into studying circus arts, like aerial arts when I lived in Brooklyn. And that really sort of like, like broke me wide open. Like, oh my gosh, like I want to make art and I want to like do circus stuff, but talk about black girl emotions. <laughs> And like, you know, then that sort of, you know, funneled into like all this other art I started to do. So, you know, I do think for me, like it really took, it, it was like this moment of like the like dark night of the soul as, you know, folks like to speak about it where I was like, man, yeah, I like working on, working with these kids and yeah, like this is noble and I'm teaching them art and I'm gardening with them but is there something else, you know? And then when I started studying circus, like it was this moment, this Jamaican sister actually was my circus teacher in Brooklyn. And I was like, what, black girls out here doing circus? Like that like blew my freaking mind, you know? And like, it was so magical, like just having like all of this vertical sort of space that lived in your imagination. So I think that was kind of this unsuspected kind of like boost of confidence I experienced. Like when you're swinging like 15 feet in the air and like doing all these acrobatics, you're like, I can do freaking anything, you know? And that's really sort of what pushed me into like, you know, I was a writer my whole life, but I started to share my writing publicly. I wouldn't do that. Um, I think also too, like kind of allowing myself to talk about the kinds of things I wanna talk about. Cause I do think, you know, 
I want to talk about Caribbeanness. I want to talk about like sweetness and romance and, you know, kind of, I love magical realism. I love speculative and science fiction, you know, like, and I want to have characters like all of us who are in this space to be the protagonist, you know, to be like Octavia Butler's another sort of lineage of blackness that I see for myself, kind of like these like futuristic. So yeah. I think I answered the question. Um, I said something, so that counts. All of it counts. <laughs> you said it beautifully. Um, I wanna take this moment just to thank you guys, to thank, um, thank each and every one of you for the work you do. Um, I wanna encourage folks to you know, pick up these books, pick them up. You know, mm -hmm. I've been trying to get through <laughs> y'all left me a lot of work a lot of reading to do and so just really know that these um sisters and i know marlon was not able to join us but the writing and the complexity and the levels that were um just present in your work is just everything and i think people really need to know that we are our own storytellers we have to tell our own stories and we can't have other people filter out what we experience and write about it as their stories because it never tells who we are and so with that i'm going to open it up for us to have the last few minutes with questions or comments from those of us who are in our audience um, but just really want to give you guys a huge hand and say thank you for being here and thank you for your journey and sharing it with us Absolutely. And now, um, in terms of the chat, now, Mary, do you want to help me with some of the uh, questions in the chat? I'm kind of sure. Uh, Nura has a, a question. So would you all say there is a pretty seamless connection to the various African heritage communities here in the US, specifically in Minnesota? Also, what are the solutions or challenges to us creating more unity among us? And because of time, maybe one person can, you know, share or you can share quickly. Keep, keep doing this sort of thing. So we actually find out who we are and where we are and we start connecting more. Mm. Nice. Yeah. I feel like it's the newer generation. Like I'm going to events and I'm seeing like East African folks and black American folks and you know, young folks, like it's interesting kind of this next generation. Mm. And I think part of that might be because of social media and because we get so much access to black culture a, the whole world gets access. So there you got the Karens appropriating cornrows, but you also have black folks getting to experience what it actually is like to be in Africa and the Caribbean and getting to you know experience each other's black culture. Um, so yeah, so I feel like here in Minneapolis, it's happening for sure. Um, but I do think like, you know, spaces like this, more black businesses, you know, I think like in this intense kind of ancestral way like there's been a lot of resources that have come to Minneapolis since George Floyd has passed you mm -hmm. know and I feel like I'm getting to see black businesses and black artistry get like I mean it's just been an interesting sort of shift you know and there's still a lot of tension around you know who gets shine who got resources and things so I do feel like um in the words of my wife, black people in Minnesota need to heal from being black people in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Cause I think there's just so much mm -hmm. trauma here. And there's so many ways that like, you know, to be, to be black here is harder than it is to be anything else here, you know, mm -hmm. to some, you know, next to our indigenous, you know, brothers and sisters and stuff like that, you know? So I do think like there is a space to really talk about healing. Like, how are we healing? And I think about, you know, um, Brother Resma and a lot of the work he's doing around, you know, racialized, you know, violence against Black bodies, you know. So, yeah, I love that question, Brother Nura. Um, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Actually, I have two questions. So the first one is: Did Doctor Vena say she's a twin? Did she say she's a Richard? No, did she say she has a twin, twin sister? No, 
Oh, no. <laughs> no, she does no, not. I have twin children. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, also, the recording. Um, how can I access the recording? We'll actually, we'll actually have it available on our um, website. Um, all of the partner organizations will have a copy. So Strive Publishing in Black Ink, um, Planting People Growing, Planting Just, Planting People Growing Justice, and um, Wise Ink will all have it available on their sites. Otherwise, you can always email us. There's um, information on the invite. You can email and contact us, and we can share it with. Okay. Um, how can I connect with other Black writers? Okay. Um, with other, actually, if you can like just stay in touch with any of these groups of folks, any of us that's actually like check out our sites. Most of us have newsletters or updates to what we're doing, um, like email or Facebook or you know some of the other social medias. Um, there's also other literary arts um, organizations that have been really doing some great work. I know um, Black Table Arts is one of them. Um, True, True Arts Speak, uh, primarily both of those folks focus in on poetry and other types of writing, but we really want to lift up any um, community that's doing this work. And thank you for your questions. I, I see there's a couple other questions in the um, in the uh, chat here, if I can answer those. And if you have more, write it in the chat and we'll definitely get back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think someone asked, well, someone made a comment about parental involvement and education are two of the things they feel are really important for us as we learn, you know, who we are. And I would totally agree. I think the images we have in our homes for our children, the um, stories we tell them. I mean, those stories come back. Like I remember, not at the time I didn't really appreciate it as much that my grandma used to always talk in, well, we always said we, she spoke in tongues kind of like, you know, the church ladies, because half of the time we didn't know what she was talking about. But then as I got older, I mean, it really started making sense. So, um, just really sharing stories, sharing about who we are with our children. A lot of secrets exist in our families. Yeah. And so people don't even know how they're related, if they're related, what they have, who they are. <laughs> you know, it's like, we, we're surprised every day. Oh, is that who I am? So it's like, just sharing those things, I think really give our children an opportunity to really find out more about it um, rather than just kind of guessing and having this information pop up um, as they get older. I just wanted to say something real quick um, based on that. Um, uh, my grandmother died a couple of years ago and at her funeral, I decided to tell all my cousins who their half brothers and sisters were because I was tired of all these secrets. I was like, why, why are we doing this? Why don't we know? Like, how come I know? I don't need to know. Y'all need to know. This here is your half brother. This here you're related to. You need to know these things. It just made me crazy. And I'm like, I refuse to keep any of these secrets. I know too many. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. We need to just have this information. Just have it. Uh, yeah. Write our story. That's right. Yeah. I'm looking to see, were there any other questions you see? Does anyone have any other question? Actually, you can just ask. I'm looking in the chat as well. Oh, hey, everybody. This is uh, Teresa Thompson Nix. Uh, people call me Queen T. Teresa. Hey, thanks for the invite. I got here a little late, but I wanted to say what an evening. Uh, I have read several of your texts as uh, people on this, and uh, I've come through several programs from Black Table Arts to um, different ones. So it's great to have this space. But uh, I've I often write about being a bearer of light and I'm wondering how you all have protected yours through the uh, process of becoming writers. Uh, how have you protected your light? Yeah, I just made up my mind. <laughs> I just, I have, you know, like the old people would say, I got a made up mind. I have a made up mind. I know what God's called me to do. 
And I think it's really important um, to stay on purpose and to stay focused on what you're supposed to do. What is your genre of writing? What is your space? What is your place? What are you called to do? And that when you focus, laser focus on that, and you keep what I would call just a pure heart in your writing, you're like, what are you writing for? Who are you writing for? Are you writing to make life better for yourself and for humanity? Like, what are you writing for? right? And it has to be bigger than you. And when you keep that in mind, that what you're writing is big, much, much bigger than you, then you know what? You can keep a smile on your face and push through those really hard times that you have sometimes when it comes to writing. Or when someone says, oh, I don't like your book. It doesn't matter. You're like in my book. It's none of my business. I've done what I was supposed to do. And then I stand. Beautifully said, beautifully said. I think, um, I know years ago we did a, uh, actually Hannah and I did a, uh, um, a presentation on writing our own story. Who's telling our story? I think that was the name of it. And part of the um, experience for a couple of people, they had a young lady that got up and left and went out in the hall because she was in tears because she, she had, as an adult, I think found out she was adopted and just Nobody ever told me this. Nobody ever told me that. And just trying to find who she was, was a huge piece that stopped her from actually even living who she was. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, for us, writing has to be a vehicle through which we heal, which we share our stories, which we um, tell the world, you know, who we are, change that narrative that exists about you know black women about black men you know and children we have to be able to write who we are into the fabric of this nation because it's they've done everything to pull us out of the fabric <laughs> of this nation so so appreciate you guys being here and i know we could probably take like maybe one last question or comment I, I just wanted to say that, yeah, um, on, to piggyback on your um, question and comment about writing. I've been writing since I was like five years old, since I got a little diary and I've just been writing little, little bitty stories. And it's, for me, it's always been the thing that I have done the most consistently in my life. <laughs> like I, it's, it just, I can't, I can't imagine my life not doing that. It's the only way I know how to process the world. It's the only way I know how to, to make me feel sane and together so it's I used to call it like it's it always feels like sort of like it's just a thing I can't I can't not do like there's lots of other things I could stop doing exactly. I can't not do that I have to do it so I mean I don't know if that I don't know if that's part of my light or not but it's it's just the thing that I'm just like well I might not know anything else about Valerie but I know she does this <laughs> this this is what I do and that's just what I do it's what I focus on Nice. And well, Mary, do you want to? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Janata. Oh, I mean, I was just going to say, bro. No. <laughs> One way I protect my light is like, I really do sort of ground with my ancestors and my rituals, you know, mm -hmm. like all of the things that make me feel strong. Also, like wearing things that make me feel beautiful, like taking time to just sort of like take care of myself, you know, because I think like for me, I think I was protecting my light in an intellectual way, but like protecting your light really is a practice and rituals of things that you can design for yourself that make you feel good and sort of, you know, situate you in your truth, you know, so. Mm. I do have to, I do have to get home. Uh, I don't want to go anywhere. Soon. <laughs> right. Oh, Lord, I'm so sorry, Cedric. Okay. You know, I'll hold it down. I'll make it up to you. Because yeah, it's okay. And um, yeah, I got I to gotta get home. Anyway. Yeah, he, 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 gave, he gave McAllister too much time today. Today. <laughs> and I'm back at it tomorrow. I'm actually seeing McAllister through your window. I haven't seen McAllister in like two years. Two years, right. <laughs> my plants are dead. <laughs> wow. Oh, my. You should have left and, some instructions. But man, two years is a lot. What you said, Cedric? I said when you get back, it's gonna be a new McAllister. So many retirements and everything else. So but oh anyway, back to the issue. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, 
Anyway. Welcome. <laughs> and I, what we talked about actually, um, if you can tell us a little about your background, I know, you mm -hmm. know, we read about who you are and stuff. And just to give you my insight from reading some of your books so far, I mean, yeah, they're huge, but the complexities you deal with is amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing. Um, I know, I think it's the New York Times or one of those magazines mentioned that you're um, kind of like the Toni Morrison, James Baldwin of today. And oh God, no. not, not to make you, you know, like, <laughs> but at the same time, I mean, it's, it's really beautiful to see that we have current day writers that are capturing this um, experience that we're having currently and putting it out on paper and then relating it to the public. So that was, that's beautiful to see. So I really appreciate Thank you. being here. Um, and just, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions. If yeah. you don't mind. Oh God, ask as many questions. I'm already feeling right. as it is. <laughs> yeah, well, if if you could just talk a bit about your background and how you were raised. Um yeah, I mean just see if I can get some more light in this room. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how was I raised? Ah, my therapist would love to hear me answer this question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I I um as a reason it's funny, I I was raised in a family where, where books were available. It's not necessarily that they were, my parents would tell me to read or read this or read that, but they made the space where the books were available and they didn't really censor anything. So um, I'm reading Greek mythology. I'm reading um, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, not knowing what the hell that is. Um, I remember... It's funny. So there's this book, um, um, William Styron's Confessions of Nat Turner, which I didn't read. I, haven't, I didn't read it at the time, but I did read 10 Black Scholars Respond to Confessions of Nat Turner because my father had it. Mm. So I'm like, what is this book that they're making all this big deal about? And, um, and I've read the book. It's kind of trash. Um, <laughs> I love Styron, but no. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, but what am I saying? That these books were lying around. These books were never forbidden for me to read. So it was always this kind of open space for, for literature, if not necessarily open encouragement. Um, my parents never discouraged me. Like in Jamaica, we have this really oppressive exam called Common Entrance. Mm -hmm. And you take it at 10 years old to go to high school. And there are kids who commit suicide when they fail. Mm -hmm. Because you have usually 90 to 100,000 kids taking, taking an exam for 9,000 spots. Mm -hmm. And you only have three chances. And if not, and sometimes you only have two. Mm -hmm. And my parents, particularly my dad, would look at me and say, you know, who you are before that exam is the same person you are after. And the exams don't mean anything. Of course, and I'm 10, I'm 10 years old. I'm like, what are you talking about, crazy man? It, of course, it means everything. But no, I'm realizing how, from even back then, my parents gave me this, quite frankly, correct attitude about education, about achievement, about society. You know, when my dad, my dad was, became a left of police force, he was a cop, he left the police force to become a lawyer. And, um, he became infamous his first week as a lawyer because he won like five cases in a row. And the week after he had, let's call it the visit from other prominent lawyers. And, a, and the visit went something like this. You now need to move out of this poor people neighborhood with all these dark skinned people. You need to divorce your dark skinned wife and marry a light skinned girl and start over your family. You can name them the same names if you want. Oh, trust me, there are people in Jamaica with two Patricias. <laughs> and, but but the, the, this whole sort of, you now have the tools to move up in society, which is a nice way of saying moving up with the white people. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he refused it. You know, and um, I didn't know what that meant when I was 10 years old or 11 or 12. I certainly know what it means now. Mm. Um, so what am I saying? Even when they weren't teaching me values, they were teaching me values. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And even when they weren't putting books in front of me, they were putting books in front of me. Mm. And even when they weren't saying, you can be whatever you want to be and we'll be here for you, they were saying, you can be wherever you want, whatever I want to be and be here for you. So I have even, honestly, it's only maybe recently I'm starting to appreciate what great and what flexible and what um, open and giving parents they were. Mm. Wow. Wow. So, so how do you think this um, upbringing and that input from your parents mm -hmm. helped um, shape or inform who you see yourself as? Well, I think how you manifest as a writer as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I think with, with both of my, with both of my parents, um, particularly my dad, they were never scared of reinvention. Mm -hmm. Um, my father's last reinvention was, was, I mean, just a few years before his death. Yeah. Um, and I think that kind of um, this idea that, you know, there can always be a next act um, in your life and that you're never too old to do anything. Um, and to, you know, to, to, to be, I don't want to say be fearless because I'm scared all the time. Yeah, it's kind of, you get to this point where, I don't know, maybe fearless is being terrified, but doing it anyway. Yeah. And, and I think that's something I, you know, uh, you know, I was in a house where, where that was encouraged, but I don't want it to make it seem like these things were always there or I noticed it all the time as if like mm -hmm. my parents were so cool and life was so cool. I didn't struggle. I struggled all the time. You know, struggle with being a writer. I struggle with 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 sex and gender, sexual and gender identity. I struggle with being a you know black. I struggle with being dark skin. I struggle in a country where we keep saying we don't have these struggles. Mm. You know, in the mm. Caribbean, you know, we love to say, "Oh, it's not race; it's class." Yeah, of course you say that because that's what colonialism taught us. Yep. Um, so I'm not trying to minimize how difficult it was to get here. Mm. Because it was, it was extremely difficult. Um, it took me a long time to trust that the voice inside my head was a voice that's worth telling stories. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to trust that the language that came out of mine and our people's mouths is worthy of literature. Um, you know, it took me a while to even believe I could be a writer. I didn't start calling myself a writer until like somewhere after the publication of my second novel. And it only happened by accident because somebody asked me if I wasn't a, wasn't a writer, what would I be doing? And I've done nearly everything. And yet I couldn't answer the question. It's like, oh crap, I guess I'm a writer then. I was like, <laughs> yeah. So I don't think I don't know if that answered the question. Wow. When did when did you write your first book? Like I wrote my first book, let's see, it came out in 2005. I wrote it around 2000 and between 2002 and 2003. Okay. And, um, and I wrote it because I was, in, I was in advertising and graphic design and so on, a field which is creative. And I went there because I wanted to be creative, but I also wanted to make money. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're in these fields, you need to know, are you a writer writing copy or a copywriter? Are you an artist doing graphics or are you a graphic artist? Mm -hmm. Both are fine. Don't confuse them. <laughs> you know, because if you are an artist doing graphics, then sooner or later, you're going to have to leave. Yeah. Sooner, because it won't, it, it, it ultimately is not going to be fulfilling. And, you know, when you come from the backgrounds we come from, the pressure to, to make money, be successful, so do all these things, be practical in your career choices is pretty hard. Mm. It's pretty heavy. And, and even if my parents didn't outright say it, I still kind of felt that kind of pressure, which means for me, writing started out as a hobby, was started out as something that I did mainly because I wanted a form of artistic expression that was mine. Um, I worked in a field where I'm selling creativity to, to people all through the day. Uh, and, I'm, and that's the main reason. And, um, you know, I wrote this no first novel, Pretty Much in Secret. Hmm. And um, 
And then when, when I became sort of convinced, meaning other people convinced me that it could be published, then I tried to get it published. And then that was a whole other thing. Um, you know, I went through, you know, 78 publishers and agents and they all said no. Oh my gosh. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, that's why, you know, even though I finished the book in 2003, it didn't come out till 2005 because I was just, and I didn't even realize I was just sending out inquiry letters like six at a time. And if I didn't hear anything, I'm like, whatever, let's send out another six. And before you know it, you know, before I knew it, I'd sent out, I, I, I remember, I remember the, the, um, the last rejection letter I got. It wasn't even a rejection. It was just a card that said not for us stamped on it. And it was from a publisher we don't have to name, Soho Press. <laughs> um, None of them remembering anything or, or <laughs> none of them carrying a grudge. But, Name but <laughs> when I got that card, it wasn't a letter, it was a card. When I got that card, that's when I stopped and go, how many of these have I gotten? Wow. And then I went and checked. And to this day, I don't know if, if, it's, a, if it's more devastating to go through the whole thing being aware Hi, Janata. I know I'm late. Oh, is that no, not Marlon, I was shocked you was going to be here, period. So I'm you like... You know what? I, we can talk about that later, but they're recording this, so I hope they can email this out to everybody. Okay, cool. I'll hush. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I am... Um, I am... Um, what was I saying? So, yeah, that's when I finally stopped and went, how many of these have I sent out? And I realized I had sent out 78 of them. And that was just devastating. I, 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 and, um, and I actually quit writing. Wow. I, you know, I quit writing, actually burnt the manuscript. It was very therapeutic. Um, not therapeutic, sorry, cathartic. That's the word I'm looking for. Oh my gosh. And um, and I just quit. I stopped. I, did, I gave up on being a writer. And um, there was this workshop that Jamaica that was happening in Jamaica at the time, the Calabash Writers Workshop. And I'd been there the year before. And they invited me again. And I was like, you know what? I know it's a I know how much money went into this. I don't want to be rude. I'll just go. Hmm. And um, a new writer was there, Kaylee Jones. Um, who's a, a novelist in her own right and her father wrote From Here to Eternity and um, she you know, saw some of the stuff I was doing the exercises and I said you know you're a good writer um, do you have anything else and I was like actually I don't write books I'm just here to humor you all because I don't want to waste people's money and there are people in the workshop who are like he's lying he has a book he just doesn't want to show you and I'm like, no, I don't have no book. I deleted that. <laughs> and, and, you know, and she looked at me and said, and this is an NSFW thing, so I'll just use abbreviations. She was like, listen, you don't know me, but I don't bullshit and I don't F around. You're a good writer and I'm not leaving this country until they give me your book. Oh my. <laughs> so of course, no, I went through and trying to undelete, undelete, you know, when you're trying to use an undelete software one year after you delete, oh, wow. don't work. <laughs> and um, I, I found it in an old computer, in an Outlook Express. People my age will know how old that is when I said that. In an Outlook Express, an, oh, in the Outbox, an email I sent to my friend Robert. And I remember printing it out. I didn't have enough paper to print the whole thing. So I cut the first 20 pages and the last 20 pages and just sent it off, which is answering a question I know somebody else was dying to ask me. That question just got answered. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and she sent it to publisher number 79, who was Akashic Books, and they published it. And um, just as a side note, because I think people think that after that, it was smooth wow. sailing from here. Wow. The book I pub we did after that, the book of Night Woman, was also rejected by nearly every wow. publisher. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was, um, you know, 
only one publisher wanted it, which was fine. And, um, you know, but from then on, yeah, publishing and so on got, got easier, but it was, it, it was a straight, it was a struggle. It's always been a struggle. It's still a struggle in some ways. You were born in Guy- um, Guyana. I was born in Guyana. You was born in Jamaica. <laughs> the accents how- are similar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right? Um, how long did you live there? I mean, I lived there for a while. I lived there until I was 34. Actually, oh, I lived there until I, okay. so right. I, right. I was 36. So, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm pretty, still a pretty recent immigrant. Wow. Okay. To, to the okay. States. So I lived there until I was 36. And, uh, and I moved basically um, to get a teaching job in Minnesota. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, again, thanks for joining us. I know uh, mm-hmm. some of the writers that were here earlier were talking about how, uh, basically their identity has either um, stayed the same or has transformed since they've been here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, many of them, are, all you guys were, had some kind of Minnesota connection. Right. And uh, now that I know that you, yours was teaching, um, mm. um, was there a, a point of consciousness that came in terms of your writing about what you wrote about, because that's some serious history you write about. Mm-hmm. And so, and then even coming to Minnesota and connecting with other African peoples, for example, mm-hmm. um, we were asking the writers about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a couple of answers to that question. Um, there was a sort of consciousness and I can even pinpoint where it happened. Um, you know, it's, it's funny enough, only one of my friends realized it, that she, she said, she noticed how the, the second half of my novel brief history, the half that starts in America is more loose and free flowing than the Jamaica half. And I was like, it's funny you should say that. Because you, you know, um, because the, the characters are literally going through what I was going through when I moved there, a sense of greater freedom and fluidity. You know, I came out in Minnesota when I came out in New York Times, but still it was Minnesota. Um, and even in that prose, the kind of um that how to put it this way, Brief History was the first novel I wrote without an idea of what a novel should be. It was like, I'm just gonna write what's in my head, what feels like me, and and I will leave it till my editor put, you know, till my editor cuts it out. And he didn't. So even the writing of that was a process of me kind of claiming the type of writer I am or want or the, the kind of writer I wanted to be. And um, so there is that. There is there was a sort of coming into identity, even in the process of writing, in the process of writing that book and the essays that I was writing around the time. And 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 Minnesota provided the space, space for that. It also helps that it was thousands of miles away from the nearest Jamaican who know me. So <laughs> you know, it's it's um uh, yeah, it's it's uh you know it, it it did provide that that um that scammers brief history is the first novel I wrote outside of Jamaica. Okay, and so, yeah, so and and it does show it. It does show it does. It, there's le- for me there's less of a concern, not just of what a novel should be, but what I should be as a writer mm. in that book. And I think that happened um, being here. Um, the other part of the question coming into a sort of. Uh, and Africanness that happened before I even started writing the last novel, which is the, the African, the sort of African fantasy or African inspired fantasy novel. It happened because I was, you know, it's funny, I was talking, speaking of fantasy, I gave this lecture a couple of years ago uh, in, um, in memory of J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, so I lectured it over the Tolkien lecture. And one thing you said, talk about is what happens when a society can take its mythology for granted. So the example I gave is King Arthur. So if you are a British person, King Arthur, even if you haven't thought about it, King Arthur means something. You know, it's knights, it's chivalry, it's the round table. But more than that, get cut deeper. It's the idea that Britain was always civilized and courtly and so on. Brit, you know, when Britain was the most backwater piece of crap place in all of Europe, <laughs> the Romans right. showed up and they were appalled. It was a grimy, nasty, backwards thinking, primitive place. Yeah. But mm-hmm. as long as they think 
Camilla, they can think rule Britannia. They can think they're better than everybody else. And we can go on about oppression, but let's not go there tonight. Um, but, but part of it is they have these foundational myths. Yeah. Now, if you're one of the Black people in the diaspora, and I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for myself, where ground zero is slavery, where you think history begins with Kunta Kinte, right. and so on, there is a certain kind of way you walk in the world when you're, when you're, when you're walking on the shoulders of your mitts that you don't, I certainly didn't have. Right. And it plays out in a lot of ways. Look at one, queerness. If I'm supposed to believe the, the newspapers, if I'm supposed to believe all I know about contemporary Africa, it's one of the most homophobic places out there. Everybody talking about gay, you know, queerness. Queerness and transness is something that we inherited from the disgusting Europeans. All of that is, of course, utter bullshit. And it wasn't until I did the research and I realized that... Um, there's always been a space in a lot of traditional African societies, religions, so on, that have accepted all these kind of things. There are certain kind of there are certain tribes in Africa with fourteen genders. There, there, there are warrior societies in a lot of ancient Africa that have always made space for queerness because you know it's like a lot. There used to be these shoga warriors that they were the only people people would trust to deliver their virgins to their husbands because they know everybody in that troop gay, so nothing going to happen. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the uh, you know, I ask, when I'm, sometimes when I'm talking, I ask said to black people, you ever notice that you never have a problem calling a single person them? <laughs> you know, so you already call everybody, yeah, me and them, them. We all do it. <laughs> if, it's, if, it's, if it's one thing, everybody black diaspora have it. We have always called one person them, <laughs> which is which is a way of saying that our natural ease and comfort with all these things are, have always been there until a bunch of preachers from America told us that they weren't. <laughs> I'm not coming. I'm not trying to knock Christianity, but I am knocking evangelical preachers. Right, right. In the sense <laughs> that um. I didn't, the thing is, I didn't, when I started doing all this research for Black Leopard Red Wolf, I didn't search out to go write a queer novel. And I didn't go out searching for queerness. And I certainly didn't go out searching for validation, but I found all of it. Mm. And I think that to me is, is crucial when we're talking about, you know, identity and African identity and, 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 and you know, thinking something is, is African when it's really just hotel. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> which is a whole other thing. Wow. Man, I'm giving really long-winded <laughs> answers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and keep it going, keep uh, it going, other... keep it going. Mm -hmm. uh, Cedric, Cedric, is that you still? <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> double my phone. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> Wait to hang in there, Sid. We call, him, we call him Cedric Douglas now because he be dropping it, <laughs> dropping it hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, we have other uh, publishers. Mary Tara, she's the publisher of uh, Strive Publishing. She's part of the collaborative. Hi, Mary. Um, I'm part of Papyrus Publishing. I'm Anura. I'm actually husband of Raquette, who runs In Black Inc., which is a uh, mm -hmm. nonprofit uh, that deals with the publishing arts. Um, and a couple of our partners uh, are are not here uh, tonight, but. Um, yeah, uh, we have some of the writers. Janata's here, and I think I've seen Valerie. She was a uh, yeah, Valerie. Uh, yeah. Yes, Valerie. She's a, yeah. Janata and, and I uh, go back. Oh, okay, yeah. So you know, uh, and Hannah. I don't know if you know Hannah. Uh, she's at McAllister now. Uh, she, she 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 was there, then she left. She came back, but she's like the director of diversity and and mm -hmm. something some. She's the. Uh, I swear, I still teach there. <laughs> I, I believe it when I see it, man. <laughs> I believe it when I see you on campus. <laughs> and so right. in terms of Minnesota, the, the short time you've been in Minnesota, I'm not sure how long you've been in Minnesota. Oh, I've um, been there like 14 years. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, so you have some experience here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what has your experience been with the different African heritage communities, you know, whether it's continental, Caribbean, 
you know, it's been, so it's, it's, been you know, it's been interesting. It's been interesting. It's been, um, you know, I, I, I've made so many friends in the Somalian and Ethiopian communities. Somalian because oh. I mean, I used to, I used to live in a Midtown Exchange building. Oh yeah, yeah. So I was right near Lake Street, and and of course I was also, you know, and this has to be said, I was also, you know, seven blocks from where George Floyd was killed. Yep. Um. So and uh, when I tell people it could have been me, I'm not being dramatic. Not at all. Not yeah. at all. Right there, um, that whole area. Yeah. So there is that, and there is the 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 you know the Black American community and the Black queer community, and it, it was interesting, you know, one th it's it's one of the tensions that I find with with a lot with immigrant communities. Well, certainly, I have it with the Jamaican community in 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 Minneapolis and abroad. Is still this sort of. I hope. I mean, I think things have come a long way, but there is this sort of willful ignorance of Black America. And this sort of idea that um, Black Americans created their own fate. You know, it's, 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 it's classic immigrant Black problems mm, or mm. immigrant Black perspectives. And I had them. Actually, I mean, I don't think I kept with them to Minnesota because I've was, I was been, I been in the, in the States for a while. But I did run into that, which is a, a short way of saying that I found myself um, moving around and getting to know all sorts of communities, but not really my own. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, um, it was, it was always to me a weird, a weird, weird tension that I can count all the Somalians I know, <laughs> but not the Jamaicans <laughs> and the last of Jamaicans in Minnesota. Yeah. Yes, it's, yeah. um, so it's, hey, yeah, you but it, it, you know, I mean, a friend of mine, I remember a friend of mine, um, we're, we're super, super close. And he's another Jamaican who moved to Minnesota. And I remember we, as getting as usual, getting in our fights. And this one is about Black Americans and the police. And he was giving me this whole thing about how his police friend told him that Black Americans want to get arrested. Mm. Mm. And there was no changing this guy's mind until the day police kick down his door, drag him out of his house and stomp him on the ground in front of his white wife. And it's not when, in, and when the police started to go, what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, I can't do anything because the person that I would call would be you. <laughs> no, man. I don't know if the turn off phrase hit him off guard, but the, the guy left. And I was like, well, I guess you're black now. Mm. You know? <laughs> Mm. Um, but there is still there is a lot of that, and there and there has been that kind of 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 you know that kind of of you know tension. So it's it's been it's it's been an experience. It's been a learning experience. Um, it's it's there's the, the, the I don't know what to say other than in a weird way being in Minnesota made me blacker. Mm. Which is a weird. I, I don't know if if I can think of another way of putting it. That than than that because I like as a, the, the, what I started, like what I start the, the the phrase I started at the beginning of this, where when you're raised British colonial, you really do think it's not racist class. Mm. And the thing about that is that you start to think certain things. One, you think racism is negotiable, negotiable because you negotiated it. Mm. Mm. And I think a lot of really aspiring immigrant people think that. Yeah, um, yeah I negotiated with it, so it's negotiable. And, yeah. it's, it's, and it's very, it, it's, it's, it's certainly possible because I used to think that. But I think there is still some that kind of thinking. I think it causes attention, um, certainly with me and some some you know of those communities. Yeah, I know. Can I jump in real quick? I know mm -hmm. we went to Brazil. This is years ago, and that was the big piece. It's not. We have no racimo here. There's no racimo. It's uh, mm -hmm. so really Brazil is saying that. I know the, that we were right in Salvador. And, and the funny thing is like, visually you go to the banks, you go to the stores, you go to the schools, mm. no dark skinned black. Oh people. my God. 
You ever, you know, I mean, when I went there, I picked up Vogue. It was the whitest Vogue I've ever seen. I picked up yeah. Architectural Digest. It's the whitest Architectural Digest I've ever seen. I turn on the TV and I'm like, man, Scandinavians probably come here and go, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that was <laughs> when I was in I Sao Paulo, the day I was leaving, we went down a street to the airport and I saw black people. I was actually screaming. I was like, oh my God, black people. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, I just completely jumped on your point. <laughs> yeah. No, but it, it's to your point that, mm. you know, race and um, class and some of those things get confused for us. And mm. it becomes confusing when we try to identify with groups of people or uh, peoplehood. And so I mm. think, um, you know, coming from Guyana, that was definitely, I didn't see black and white. I saw, you know, mainly East Indian and, and African, you know, mm -hmm. and that was the um, distinction in terms, but the pieces of white supremacy and how the different groups treated each other were mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I recognize, you know, the feelings and the, you know, the inclusion and the exclusion and the, you know, those types of things, but I didn't recognize the faces because it was not, we didn't have white people in Guyana that I, I don't remember mm -hmm. seeing white people. Yeah. Um, before we go on, I don't want to miss the questions that are in the chat. Yes. Um, so as Janana said, you've been to Cuba. I've also visited Cuba. What do you think about race in Cuba? Now, that's an interesting question because let's start with the positive first. Of all the places in Latin, Hispanic, Caribbean, Latin America, they're the only ones who ever tried to deal with racism. So I give them that, that there has been an attempt. I don't think it succeeded at all, but I think as, as bad as Anglo-Caribbean is with racism, then you get to Spanish Caribbean and I go, damn, what the hell? See, I'm not surprised in the heights came out so light skin. Please. I would have been shocked if it hadn't. Yeah. I, I, I was like, it, it's, it's, I mean, I'm not, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get on the Hamilton rant, even though I do. Listen, have one. listen, go in the rant, go even in the rant. I have one. Let me egg you on. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's so here. And I think, you know, it's a funny thing about, about I mean, when you go to somewhere like, um, like Chile or even Ecuador. There is this idea, and it's in Anglo-Caribbean too. I don't know if it, it, it there's certain parts of America where I've seen it, where whiteness is achievable. And if whiteness is achievable, why would you want to stay black? This played out in my own family. So, so my family's name is Pringle. Google Pringle, you won't see anybody with my skin color. Um, and one of the reasons why is that at some point in our centuries old history, somebody in my family made the big mistake of marrying darker, which interrupts the whole centuries long plan of us moving towards white so we can be full free. And it caused a split in our family that exists to this day. Two years ago, we were doing a reunion. The banners are even printed. Pringle James reunion. 2017 everybody came down the night before the pringles call and go oh there's a we have a, a tragedy in the family we won't be making it and i went all right so the food the feud is back on then you know it's it's what where am i going with this of course you know i, I say it in jamaica all the time you don't need white people around to practice white supremacy um i forgot where i was going with this original right and Manuel Miranda, the light skinnedness of it all. right. The, 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 you know, I mean, oh God, you know, no, but to go back to, to, Anna's, to Anna's point, I think the racism, because the idea that whiteness is achievable, you go to, you, you go to somewhere like Chile, you'll see 10 white people line up. In fact, they did it. They did that Walker, Walker Art Center. I remember this Chilean theater troupe showed up and they had these skits in between. And one of the skits was, no, let's land up in terms of color. And I'm like, but y'all white. But they could do it. They could go, I am the whitest white. You are the mediumest white. You are the darkest white. And there is, there is this, it's a, it's a, it's because it's a, a very acute. And this will sound strange. 
a very unsophisticated racism. Like when I was in one of, one of the first times I went to the UNIT to the UK, um, this British person came to ask me how am I liking London, how am I liking Britain, and I was like, I love Britain. Your racism is so cute here. Yeah, um, and unlike say Italian racism, where they really think it's cute when they compare you to a monkey. I think that with, I will give this about American bigotry that I think a lot of, until at least until Trump came into power, I think a lot of people still knew that this was no longer in the realm of mainstream thought. It's like, or acceptable mainstream thinking, like only up to a few years ago, you could still have a pretty popular career as a rapper and be publicly homophobic. Yeah, and some of those, and some of those guys still flipping homophobic. Yeah, um, but there is that idea that this is no longer in mainstream thinking in a way, whereas you don't get that in some of these other countries where they don't simply get that you can't just, you can't just, you know, if Obama show up, you can't give him a, a figurine of a monkey as a present. I'm not saying anybody did that, but I'm sure somebody would have. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's then little Nas X. I love him so much. He's my little brother. Uh, I said, that's my little brother. Oh my God, he's so on in Twitter today. Well, I'm, I'm going to throw one of those other questions in there. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we asked Janata and um, Valerie and Verna this also, but let's pretend or assume there's a global or even a localized Black African identity. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that for you have filtered into and impact your writing? Um, well, I mean, it's impacted in, in, very, in a very specific way because of the novels I'm writing now. Mm. Um, and it's, it's also impacted it in, in, in the sense, in the sense of um, one of the things about, one of the things I think about black communities, black American communities, and even Jamaican communities that I think we get from African culture and an African way of thinking is ma all, all making space for people. Um, so like in the old days, you know, they'll say the queer guy down the street, the gay guy down the street, yeah, Luther, he's sweet. Yeah, he's sweet, but he our sweet. Mm -hmm. And that is always, you know, it is, it's always, um, you know, it, 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 that's always sort of made that kind of, you know, that space. Um, I, you know, I remember recently, recently, somebody, I, a man from Nigeria, a professor from Nigeria asked me, if I ever wonder the reason why so many black kids may be doing bad in school in America is because they were never meant to be taught that way. And I've always, you know, I've held out, you know, I've always held on to that. The thing about writing this novel, these novels, is that it's not just a matter of changing scenery. It's not just a matter of, of um, changing locale and putting some zebras in my damn book. Um, I also had to change the way of thinking, even how I was thinking about writing literature and the values in that literature. Here's one of them that I didn't know until I, I was starting to check out languages like Wolof. Um, I always thought it was some sort of linguistic backwardness when we only use words, verbs in the present tense. I always thought it was, you know, I always thought it was, it was, um, just broken English. And I hate that term because it implies it needs to be fixed. On, then I started looking at languages like Wolof and I realized a lot of African language, particularly Western Central African languages, verbs are always present tense. Action is always an immediate thing. So when we say things like, nobody says went, he did go or him done go. He done go, he can't go, he will go, he soon go, he can't go, he going go. I just thought it was out of backward ass English. Or oh, to realize, no, it's just one of those things that the middle passage couldn't stomp out. Um, 
And so I think even, even on, and that's a very simple, very sort of simple level on which I'm explaining this. But even on that level, you'd be surprised how empowering it is to know that the way I am speaking and the way I wrote was something that was actually more a part of a triumphant spirit than a broken language. Something as simple as that. I know as a writer who use words all the time, something like that, the liberation of words is something that, that absolutely directly connects to the liberation of my personality. Marlon, I gotta go to the co-op. Why you gotta I go? I haven't to... seen you in like two years. I know, if you would've came on time, just kidding, I'm not gonna mess with you about that. You know, but I Jamaican you. comes on Jamaica time. Listen, you know what? I should have came an hour late too. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. I'm just no, glad no, they're no. recording this so, so we can actually make something out of it. Yeah, I adore you so much. And I'm going to hit you up because I'm, you know, yeah, you got so much to teach. So mm -hmm. bye, everybody. Bye, Janata. Thank bye, you. Bye, Janata. Yeah, take care. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, you, you might want to write a book about time, that Jamaican time you're talking about, because two hours. <laughs> I remember when, when we were getting um, married, I was looking at what a West Indian, um, primarily a Guyanese wedding looked like. Mm -hmm. And they um, one of the main things they drove in there was that people come all day. They come whenever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it starts when you get there. And when you get there isn't like a time you pick but it's the time when people come. Yeah. <laughs> so well, the problem with that is that you never know when they're going to leave. Exactly. And then they come and they don't go. <laughs> they never <laughs> leave. They never leave. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, you know, I mean, the secret thing when people leave any Caribbean function is to just stop serving out food. Never. <laughs> <laughs> food or drinks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but this is wonderful. Um, did anybody else have any other questions? I mean, I well, really... I'm going to scroll through, see if I missed anything. Yeah. As you're doing that. Oh, you know, what? one of the ones that we talked about, and you kind of hit on it a little, was um, some of the challenges or complexities of creating. Um, I'm, I'm switching up the question that I have, but of creating your concepts, you know, like how you actually create your characters. One mm. of the things that struck me specifically in the brief history was like, there's so many layers of who these char characters are. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of them, it's, it's not biology or inheritance or, you know, lineage. It's the experience that they're having, you know, in the current day, like the trauma and the drama and all that stuff that created who they are. And that was really, I mean, I was just really into those characters. And so mm -hmm. just if you could talk a little about how you, you know, if there are challenges that you face in creating those. Yeah. Um, I, you know, usually with, with, with novels for me, the characters show up first. Mm. And that usually means that I don't know what the hell they're doing here. And uh, I don't know what their story is. Uh, most of the novel, I, you know, I mean, I've written four novels, and three of them are in in first person. Yeah. Um. Even even Book of Night Woman, even though it's first person about somebody else. Yeah. Somebody's actually telling telling a story, and I think one of the reasons why is because for me, I have to get to the point where I think I'm not a novelist. I'm just a journalist for imagined people. Hmm. And one of the reasons why I also think I can write or I have written some horrendous shit, you know, is because I have to sort of take myself out of it and be true to the characters. Um, you know, when people say things like, you know, I can't read um, night, you know, Book of Night Woman because there's so much violence and sla you know, slavery and brutality. And I'm like, you know, I get that it's hard to read about slavery, but it's probably just a little bit better than being a slave. You know, so shut your mouth and go bear witness. You know? <laughs> um, it, but but you know, it's that's not to say it's not it's not hard, but it's not easy. Sorry, but for me, 
and I think this go why why my novels read the way they do is because I have to sort of just start listening to what the characters are telling me and what kind of story it is. And that wasn't always easy. Um, for Book of Night Woman, there are 50 to 60 pages somewhere around here, which I don't know where they are, where I tried to write it in third person. I tried to write it in what I think the voice should be. Mm. And, um, and it was a terrible novel. Um, it's, 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 it was through a constant struggle some of which had to come over my ridiculous sense of shame about dialect. Yeah. And um, to, to realize that this novel is told in voice and only one voice, you know, that only one voice can, you know, only one voice can tell it. Um, but it's, it's still, it, it came down to listening to the character even before I had a plot. And I mean, if I started out with plots, I'd have written such shorter books. Mm. <laughs> um it, it's it's sort of staying around for everything the character is trying to tell me and then staying around longer for the stuff they're trying to not tell me yeah okay you want the secrets too and I um is a, you know, sorry yeah, to but i think it's amazing that you're able to write a book of this size and all of it be interesting i mean it's like i had to read and then i had to do the audio as well mm -hmm. and just because the reading and the audio, I think I, I needed to hear the voice. Like you said, the yeah. dialect is really important. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's it's just the layers that you put in it is just really, it's beautiful. Thank you. It's, um you know, it's also following a character. It's following a character wherever they want to go, including into places I don't like. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was frustrating to me about writing Lilith in Brief History is that she makes all these decisions I don't approve of. Yes. And I was like, seriously, girl, really? Yeah, you kind of want to like her, but then it's like, <laughs> it's, it's the, the, not even the decision, the fact that she couldn't, she couldn't change it is like. Yeah, I, I was far more interested in a, in a character you love, even if you don't yeah. like her. Yeah. Um, and that I think that I got from reading um, Toni Morrison, but in particular, Sula, you know, which is a novel, Christ, I've read that novel so much I can recite it now. Mm. Uh, but I, it, it's because I remember when I was trying to write characters like Lilith and, and my, te my teacher at the time, director at the time was like, you know, you don't have a clue about women. And I was like, what are you talking about? I have a mother. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, they like to have things like Republicans say every time they come up with anti-woman legislation. Um, but, and then she said, and then, but then she said something, which is something I always shoot back at male authors. She asked me, how many women have I read? <laughs> and then when I could name them, I go, if you can name how many, then you haven't read any. And she said, and she was the one who said, you need to read Toni Morrison. Wow. And I thought she, met, she was trying to get me to write these noble female characters. And no, that's not it at all. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, if you, you want the characters do sick shit, let them do sick shit. But we have to understand where they're coming from to the point where it almost seems inevitable that they would have do the things that they do and make the decisions that they make. And that's one of the things I like about, about Toni Morrison's characters. Some of them fly wildly off the rails. Some of them do really terrible things. Some of them force you to make quest answer questions you don't want to answer. You know, if you're going to read Beloved, you're going to have to confront the idea that murder can be an act of love. You're going to have to confront it. Yeah. I'm not saying you're going to accept it and you shouldn't. Maybe. Yeah. But you can't escape it. You cannot escape it. You can't escape it. And um, and it gave me those novels, Song of Solomon in particular. Well, I can't even do it. If I, if it, I go crazy picking. <laughs> but they say, uh, together, they freed me to, to, to sort of, I don't want to say allow, because I, I don't allow my characters to do anything. They do what they want. But to, to sort of... To, to sort of, I guess, hang along for the ride as these characters go in whatever directions 
direction they choose, including directions I sure as hell wouldn't go myself. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, I, it's amazing that as a man, you were able to capture such nuances of the female characters um that even as I was reading I did forget that he was a male writer a lot of times you're confronted with that like oh this mm. is a man writing about this I mean he doesn't know oh my god there's this um <laughs> my friend uh, a friend of mine has a, a a feminist book festival in the UK and um one of the one of the funniest panels particularly it seems some of the guys were not in on a joke was women men writing women <laughs> and you know she and and the, the 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 head the title of the panel was she and her breasts sauntered into the room oh my gosh <laughs> and then we said you know what let's do a week where we write men, where, where we write men the way men write women <laughs> so i did i was like he wasn't much to look at <laughs> harry you know no looks no personality no brains but had a determination of a heart <laughs> Yeah, that that's actually a pretty decent exercise. I think that all it's, writers it's, should have. It's it's great because there's <laughs> always what I call dude in your creative writing class. Yeah. Who never who just doesn't get it. That's an excellent idea <laughs> because <laughs> it, it it I mean just because of the topic areas and stuff, especially in the book of night women, the topic areas that you confront, you mm -hmm. have to have and the experience. I, I mean just. That enslavement period was so traumatic, and mm -hmm. for you to capture the level of, um, I keep saying nuances, but be, because there's like, you, um, you know, you get, um, yeah, the thing, say you I get Homer thing, on this level, but they, yeah, I think one of the things that we 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 should remember when we're writing about slavery, one, you have to, res you know, I, I, I always say, you know, first say respect you. Yeah. Because whatever they were going through, whatever they knew, whatever they suffered, they still somehow managed to survive long enough that we're here. Yep. And if nothing else, props for that. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that these are people who are living in a normalized abusive relationships and, 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 and normalize. In fact, it's not even an abusive relationship. That's letting it off too easy. They're, they're living in, in a, in, in a ear, in a ear where, where they're trying to normalize atrocity, which mm -hmm. they failed in doing by the way. Yeah. And you know, they failed in doing it because every time Christmas they arrive and the slaves are celebrating Master couldn't understand why they're celebrating so well. Why is their party better than ours? Because they know the atrocities they're doing. Nobody should be celebrating anything. Yeah. But that's a whole other point on, on, on how you can't stop black joy. But um, the point I was going with this is that it's also the people are cruel to these slaves, but these slaves are often cruel to each other. Yeah. That was a, that was through and through in both your in in even in the brief history. It's like I feel mm -hmm. that that brutality that was waged on us mm -hmm. continues on in our interaction with each other. Yeah, I think it's it's um I I mean I think so, but I think I think so, but I think so to a point. I think that the danger in the danger in 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 this is people looking at it as some kind of explanation of of that mythical black on black crime bullshit that um that because we were in highly oppressive and brutal regimes were then brutal and i'm like if that were the case then we 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 all here wouldn't be wanting equality we'd be wanting revenge so the very fact that we're pushing for equality already disproves that thesis. That said, I do think that um, that the, the 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 these societies that slaves learn brutality, 
But I think it's a it's really uh, this they learn brutality and they practice brutality, but it's really erroneous, I think, for us to think that that is that is one of the legacies that endured. I have issues with that. Because it's also ignoring that there's some distinctive 20th century bullshit that happened. We didn't need slaves for Tulsa. And we certainly didn't need slaves and slavery to drive a highway through Rondo. You know, and essentially putting to an end the Harlem of the Midwest. It's, um, you know, <laughs> um, you know, slaves didn't have a police problem. So I don't want to, it's, it's, I think it, it can be kind of dangerous when people are starting to map these things saying there's this legacy, because I don't think I agree. I don't think I believe it. I think there are enough atrocities and cruelties and lessons in the land of the free, the free part. And there's so much of the way in which this 20th century was run including poverty and redlining and all these sort of all these sort of let's call it northern state problems that explains all of that that explains you know that explains explains a lot of that i think it's 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 a testimony that we didn't take the atrocities we learned from slavery and visited it on our people like i said you know it, it's it's People should be dropping on their knees that what we want is equality and not revenge. What would you um, say, um, you know, um, are some of the challenges or solutions to mm -hmm. possibly create more unity? Seems like we get our freedom the more- Hold on, created more, more what? We didn't hear that. Unity. Right. Unity or functional unity or mm -hmm. efforts. You know, I think, um, you know, like in some of your books, you know, when you try to get people on board with the plan, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't go all the way because everybody's not on board with the plan. <laughs> and mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and writing can help us with that, I know, but uh, what do you see as some of the challenges to, to uh, African people uh, connecting more or getting more unified on more on the same page? Mm -hmm. um, I know you talked about the ignorance of you know, a lot of immigrants of the black experience mm -hmm. here. Um, but do, do you see um, that as a, as a, as a natural process or something we can help instigate or? Mm -hmm. I think it's, what are it's your the, for that? I think the, 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 the solution to more community is more community. I think um, it's, um, it's all well and good for me to say the Jamaicans don't reach out, but are people reaching out to the Jamaicans? You know, it's all well to say that the, the Somalians are closed off, but are we reaching out to the, you know, reaching out to the Somalians? Um, I think that there are all sorts of avenues for for communication and all sorts of avenues for sharing stuff. And sometimes, I'll, some, and sometimes it's just a matter of an invite. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, I, you, 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 you're doing a book launch, but where are you doing it? What communities? Can we do it? Can we reach out to? I think it's, it's. I think there's sometimes too much of an assumption that communities don't want to participate when we re when when it really is communities aren't being reached out to. Some of them you just have to. You just have to do the work. You have to do the reaching out. It's uh, you know, it's it's. There's so many barriers. If I am a Somali immigrant, including maybe language, uh, you know, or so on. It's it's. I think. Um, I think. And I'm not saying I have concrete ideas about what that reaching out might be, but I also think sometimes, you know, it, it reminds me of um, <clears throat> some very well-meaning white people were asking me after not even George Floyd, Philando Castile, what should they do? What should they do? And one of the things I said, well, one of the first things you want to do is not wait until another Philando Castile before you reach out. None of them reached out because I would have heard. Yeah. Um, and so we ended up with a George Floyd. It was funny. I wrote an article and they reprinted it in, in the Guardian a few weeks ago. And they asked me to put a preface about one year after George Floyd. Do I think the article is as urgent as ever? I go, I'll tell you why it's urgent. That's not an article on George Floyd. 
Huh? Right, right. Um, yeah, uh, it's, 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 where am I going with this? That um, it's too easy to say that we can't reach these communities because they're not reaching out. Some of them don't even know how. And, I, and what I said to them is, you're going to have to do some of that work. Yeah. You know, they, they, I think the payoff is great, but you can't just assume that the reason why nobody Alan. showed up at your thing is because nobody's interested. Alan. I'm sorry to interrupt. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the name of the book you said you like? I think you called it you said it's called Sula. Sula, mm -hmm. like by Tony Morrison, S U L A. S U L A, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey Raquel, you think we should do just one final question from anybody? Yeah, does think, anyone have any uh, yeah. final questions? It looked like some people heard I, I came, I finally came online and joined. I know, us. and jumped back on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, while people are thinking if they have a final question, can you think, is there like a message or something you would like, or you would offer to, you could actually even personalize it to yourself because you said you didn't come into writing until later on. Mm -hmm. I think there's a number of us that also, don't get that level of confidence to come into, you know, being able to put our thoughts and our mm -hmm. um, imagined worlds together. Yeah. So what message would you give that earlier self of yours and the younger writers that are yeah. entering? I would, I would tell my earlier self, and I tell younger writers, there are certain things that you're waiting for to write, like confidence. You don't need confidence to write. Okay. Um, you're waiting for, you're waiting for bravery. You don't need bravery to write. Um, you can be quite fearful. I am scared to death every time I start to write something. Uh, I, I, I was on this panel and this person was talking about because of political correctness and blah, blah, I'm afraid to write on the page. I'm like, wow, you mean you weren't afraid before? <laughs> I'm terrified all the time. I think this is the book that's going to kill me. Um, I think, you know, sometimes all you need is to just start. And understand that we put a lot of pressure on that first word. We put a lot of pressure on that first sentence. We put a lot of pressure on that first page. Nine, and 99 times out of 100, the first page people will read is not the first page you wrote. All that page is doing is welcoming you. And you may write a paragraph, a page. For me, it's usually 50 to 60 pages before I realize what I want to write. And those are not wasted pages. I'm grateful for those pages because you're discovering, you know, I also tell people, you don't create stories, you find them. Mm. And, and that's the thing, the, the, the process of discovery, that process of discovery can be as fast, as slow, as quiet, as loud as, as you, as it possibly, as it could be. There is no judgment. There are no standards. One of the things that a lot of us face is as soon as we start writing, our internal critic, critic shows up. You can't do this. That's not good enough and blah, blah, blah. And, I, and, and, and what I find is I, 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 I came across a sort of a, I work on this negotiation with my internal critic, which is that critic can do a lot of things. He might even be kind of smart, but one thing that internal critic cannot do is create. And if you're in creation mode, just tell your internal critic, you know what? You actually aren't helping here. You can help later, but you can't help the creative process. Because this is what happens when you listen to your critics too much. You, you stop creating and you start correcting. And if all you're doing when you're writing is correcting, 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 you're never going to know where your creativity was taking you. Because all you're doing is fixing, fixing, stopping, curtailing, and so on. I'm a big believer in messy first drafts. I believe your first draft should be absolutely terrible. I mean, man, if you write a good first draft, kudos to you. I've never been able to pull that miracle off. And honestly, I don't want it. Um, because you are also writing towards what you are going to write. 
And that's a process and it takes a time and it means being patient. And honestly, a day sitting down, reading some, reading some other stuff and staring at your computer, that's still a writing day. A day where you didn't write a word, but you thought about what you don't want to write, that's a writing day. Mm. And, and realize that, realize, and also believe that you have a story worth telling from the simple fact that you are here to tell a story. You know, everybody, fine, everybody might fall in love, everybody might get married, everybody might, not everybody, everybody might live in, a, in, in, in the suburbs. But you know what? Not everybody lives in 34 Hamilton Street, an apartment 2B. <laughs> not everybody lives there. Not everybody get up and wake up and so on. Not everybody woke up in your bed. Not everybody's seen a window. The, the scene. Every, all of us are looking at Minneapolis. Not everybody's looking at it through your window. Mm. Mm. So you have to believe that you have a story to tell and don't believe that don't, don't believe that your story isn't worthy of being told. Your story is worthy of being told by the simple fact that you have it. And yeah, sure, everybody, everybody has been through heartbreak, but chances are they haven't been through heartbreak like you. Yeah. And I think that's something to, 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 to realize. There is nothing wrong with thinking you have a special point of view. You have something to bring that somebody else you know, somebody else isn't. Nice. Thank you for those words. Um, I think that that's the biggest piece for a lot mm. of us starting. So thank mm. you. The next August is our part next of our series season. is uh, Continental African writers. Mm -hmm. And so we have a few writers from the um, Twin Cities, um, Minnesota, area that will be doing this again and because we're really trying to you know dive into like that separation of you know mm -hmm. us as writers and as African you know writers and trying to find how do we kind of make sure that our stories are the stories that we tell and we share from all of the experiences that we've had so mm -hmm. that it's not just we're trying to get like one single story like um our, our sister Nigerian sister uh, talks uh, about. Mwanda. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we don't we we know that that has not been our experience, but we overlap in so many places. That's beautiful. So thank you, thank you. It's really great meeting you. And, and hearing so from you, some serious jewels you dropped there, some serious wisdom. We appreciate yeah. it. We'll benefit uh, absolutely, all. absolutely. Yes, thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Um gonna turn it back to Mary. I know we have like a minute, <laughs> but we wanna properly close out here. Um, well, I wanna thank everyone for coming out tonight, spending time with us. And um, I wanna thank the panelists, especially for sharing your stories and your light and your inspiration. Um, hopefully you will save the chat because there's a lot of good comments in the chat as well as some resources for those who are interested in finding writing groups. And uh, remember, this is a series. So our next one is when, Miss Sister Burkett? Is it next month? Actually, no, our next one I think is August. Mm, August. And we don't have an actual date yet. So please watch our, um, our sites, our social media. We will post, um, yeah. And we'll send out information as well. But the next one is um, first generation uh, continental African writers. And um, that series um, should be just as far as this because we're all, you know, getting that pen and putting it to work. Hi. Um, I um, I, I'm, I don't I hope I'm not interrupting the track of the of the discussion or anything, but have but are any of you um planning to go to the online Black Book Festival on the 25th of September. Um, it's this, up, this upcoming uh, September. Um, it's it's uh, free online, but it's by Simon Education. Can you put it in the chat and we'll make sure people have that available to them? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. Well, and we wanted to say thank you to everyone. I know we're, we're at 731. 
appreciate your time. Um, Hannah, if you can have us get go out with a little bit of music. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Valerie, Janata, Dr. Bruno.